You're live. <gasps> You're live. I, it's amazing. It's amazing. Oh my God. Hi, wow. everybody. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Jimmy's channel. If you're watching uh, from the private Facebook group, if you're not on the private Facebook group, go ahead and click the link in the description. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, we got some prizes coming up. This is a four day woodworking event. It's the Maker Series. Look at that beard. And uh, I feel like the same. And, uh, you know, so it's live in our private Facebook group. You can click the link in the description. Today we got Jimmy. Tomorrow we got John Peters. Later in the week we have the Samurai Carpenter. There's some plans in there. We're going to show you how to build some projects. So if that interests you, make sure you click the link in the description if you're watching on YouTube. Is there four? Is there, am I one of four teachers? Is there a four you, teacher? Or is it, the, uh, there is. Uh, Adam Hankel. You're one of four. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so Adam Hankel is coming in on Wednesday. He's a, he's a master carpenter. So he'll be joining in the group and sharing kind of his process. But today we are going to be talking uh, with Jimmy Dresta. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on your channel. And um, thanks, anyways, thanks. Uh, so good. you just got back from California. Um, yeah. Do you want to quickly speak to that? I know we talked about it yeah. before we went I was by. away. I was away for uh, four weeks, about four and a half weeks. I had to get out there a little early because of um the coronavirus and the coronavirus lockdown the time out there was uh it was great it was great it had a lot of a lot of time to think a lot of alone time because they didn't want you to socialize i did get a chance to visit a few friends and have one or two dinners but you know we all socially distanced and i got out of california just in time because the curfew hit like the couple days after oh, wow. i was able to leave and uh so yeah it went well considering you know anything that, like we to prepare, they were prepared to shut down, unfortunately, if they had to. But we got all the way through the whole entire series. It went really well. This season's going to be great. I talk a lot more on this episodes. These episodes, they interviewed me a few times, so and I got a little bit more involved in the judging process, you know, behind the scenes. So it was great. You know, they're they're they're, they're beginning to utilize me a little bit more throughout the various elements of the show, you know, in front and behind the camera. So and, it's great. And when does that go live? They're thinking early next year, but I, okay. I don't know personally when. You know, they, they began to edit the episode one the minute it was in the can, and it's two and three and four. So they were seeing rough edits before I even left, but, you know, I'm not privy to that stuff until it's published. Okay. And so that's I know uh, listening, they were doing that. They were getting really jumped. They were jumping on it. That's making it on NBC coming in 2021. Season three. Season Thank three. You. Awesome. We're going to get into it uh, now. So basically what we're going to be covering uh, is Jimmy's just going to share some of his tips and tricks. We've got some video that we're going to be pulling up here in a minute. And he's going to just share uh, to help you out in the shop. I mean, that's the goal of today's uh, teaching series is his processes. You know, I remember um, you sharing a while back that, you know, how you kind of get to the end result is kind of learning how not to do things. And, yeah, um, like walking in the dark through an apartment every now and again. That's really what <laughs> learning is like. And so we're <laughs> gonna, we're gonna <laughs> so we, ideally we leapfrog those lessons, uh, and you know he'll share what he uh, has learned. So the first thing we're gonna take a look at, and I'll try to share my screen effectively here, is um, we're gonna take a look at kind of uh, design process and in terms of. Um, you know, if he's dealing with a, we're gonna take a look at a small project here and maybe just walk the audience through your process for designing right out of the gate. Yep. You know, it's funny. Sometimes I draw a picture before the video is done and sometimes I draw it right after because I make some changes. I think I might've drawn this just before because I had a pretty clear vision of a simple square box. So this was really just, uh, I do this from time to time when I used to do television shows more often and I was the star of the show. They, the producers always asked me to draw what we were going to make and they used it on camera. And occasionally I do that. And uh, I don't necessarily go into uh, like any kind of CAD program, partly because it just slows me down. I'm very much more of a hands-on guy. I jump right in. And even Aaron and I, Aaron's sitting here across from me. We had a conversation this morning about something he wants to build. And I said, just build. He's, it, it's, it's more of like a skeletal wire thing. I said, make it out of just scrap wire first. You know, I, I always go into every project with the mindset of I could make it once, I could make it twice, I could make it three times, and each time I can improve it. You know, so a lot of people are a little too precious about the projects they approach. So I think it's really important to be loosey goosey. You know, that's how some people operate. That's how I operate. Some people are more straightforward, and that works for them. But if you don't know anything, it's important to kind of remain a little bit loose. This way, you, you, you're not too uptight about the process. So then, it, so that this. 
so from that was like a sketch you had in your mind and then you had a larger project. This, um, let me just pull this up here. Um, this was your rocking chair build. If you haven't checked it out, you can check it out on his YouTube channel. Um, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is on the Rockler channel and also my channel. Okay. There's two versions of it. One behind the scenes, which is where I talk more about it in, uh, in real time. Aaron's interviewing me. And then on the Rockler channel is more of a traditional Duresta style video where you see the beginning, middle and end of the build. So in this one, you decided to kind of do like a, a larger sketch version of it. You know, what, what's, what's the process there and, you know, why was uh, well, that? There are some few key elements that, you know, like when you make a chair, there are things that have to actually be met. You could make a really low chair, but it won't be a traditionally comfortable chair. You want a traditionally comfortable chair, especially for a rocking chair, which is intended to be a relaxed environment. So I took measurements off of a chair I had in here that I liked the height and the arm height. And those are two things that I couldn't change. I couldn't change the height of the seat and I couldn't really change the height of the arms, you know, within a, within a, a small amount, a small variable. And so with those two things, I try to land the legs and the angle of the back at, you know, more of an artistic, an art with an artistic slant, you know, no pun intended. So I was really sticking to some standard things. So I knew I had to stick within standard measurements of architectural, you know, environmental design. Okay. Um, that makes sense for sure. So then the next one we're going to take a look at here was the fence um, or the gate video that you recently did probably about a month and a half ago, I think. Oh yeah. Yeah. I did the gates in the back of my property. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you did something a little bit different in terms of the layout and the prep for it. It was more, um, oh, yeah. you know, with this one, you, you kind of put it on the floor. Um, well, that's because like, uh, you know, it, it is funny because there are certain, again, this is a pretty good tip. You have to decide where it's important to keep a drawing and, mm -hmm. and then like a drawing is just only a little bit of a means to a certain next step ending. So in this case, I knew if I draw it on the ground, I don't have to lay out a big giant piece of paper. I can use chalk. I could quickly erase. I can go back and forth. And then as soon as the frame was laid out, I didn't need the drawing anymore. So I didn't need to waste paper. I didn't need to clear off three bench tops to lay it across. So with the with the rocking chair, I referred back to it a few times off camera to make sure that I was landing in certain spots. So with the gate, once the gate was built and no human being had to literally be physically involved with it other than just hanging it up and swinging it. Yeah. That was so you really got to decide where is the drawing going to basically self-destruct and it doesn't matter mm -hmm. and where is the drawing going to be a roadmap for the entire project. And also, the scale of the piece of paper I would have needed to draw the gate on, it would have just went to waste within a few minutes of me getting to the frame edge. So that's so why I decided to just draw it on the ground. Have you done that with other like other big projects before, or like to get it off actually off the paper and onto you know the workbench or something like that, where you actually map it out oh. to that extent? Yeah. Yeah, like sometimes like, I remember sometimes I did a project where I had to draw a big giant circle, so I laid plywood on the tabletop. Mm -hmm. And I put a pivot point like out in the room. It, it needed like a very, like the radius was like almost 12 or 13 feet. So I just like set a vise up in the room on a stand and grabbed a piece of string in the vise and I did my layout. So, oh, okay. to, you know, so you got like environmental layout is important. You got to figure out where it's important. You know, sometimes I could have laid that out in a computer pattern and then printed it out and tiled it together. But it's simple to just jump to a string and a pencil and put a pivot point in space. You yeah. see what I mean? Yeah. You know, totally. so if you're making a big giant hoop, for instance, you know, you could draw that on the floor or you could just use your radius in space. You know, you really got to decide where it is. You know, it's some people only know the idea of printing it out. So mm -hmm. they'll get stuck in their mind printing it out. Like even on the TV show, the contestants come to me with like a drawing and I'm like, okay, so let's just draw it right on wood. They're like, oh, you don't need like another version of it. I'm like, no, we'll go, we're going to make it. Eventually it's going to be made. So we're moving further away from concept, closer to reality faster. Cool. You know? That's a good tip. Um, yeah. Next one. So that's kind of design. And then we get into material selection. Um, mm -hmm. Now I know recently you've, you've, I remember you said your first love was, um, woodworking and now it's kind of transitioned a bit where you incorporate a lot more metalwork into your projects yeah. and yeah. so when you kind of lay out a uh, you know you've got the design concept down and obviously material selection is uh, super important um, in this in this one right here we, uh, where you did the stools I believe there's three different materials that were incorporated oh, yeah, into this yeah. and uh, maybe just speak into a little bit about you know the material selection that you 
You know, so I think you got leather here and uh, yeah. obviously steel casings at the bottom. Well, it's funny, uh, you know, to the to the credit of, I, I mean, I, I've been so fortunate to work with so many like creative visionary companies that that aren't too rigid in what they want. So, for instance, Weaver Leather said, hey, for one of your projects, we want you to just make whatever you want and put bring leather into it however you see fit. Nice. We don't want it. You, know, you don't have to make a bag. You don't have to make something with all of our findings. And so I've been wanting to make a set of stools for a really long time, especially with my new lathe that I got. And I have this beautifully perfect scaled stool that I've had for years. I've talked about it in a few videos. I found it in the garbage probably, I don't know, 20 years ago. And me and Taylor use it as the standard. It is like our, it is like our gold standard for size of furniture when it comes to making stools. And so I copied that shape and size, but I sexied it up by making these walnut legs fatter, choosing walnut. I knew I had all this walnut sitting around that I, why did I buy that walnut originally? I bought it for something else, didn't I? The walnut? Yeah. I can't I remember. Oh, it might have been actually your first thought was a pass on the, on the chair. I was gonna. I was gonna. I, oh, you know what it was? I bought the walnut for the stools, and then I okay. used all the leftover walnut for the rocking chair. That's what it was. Um, <laughs> so I did buy it for those stools to make those, and I actually ended up making four more for two other clients. I, somebody ordered two, and somebody else ordered two. So I made eight of those stools in total. Um, two on, you know, four on camera, and two and two sets off camera. But so the the idea of the steel was another thing because um, when I realized the design, I realized I could only weld it while it was mm -hmm. all together. And then most people might go, oh, well, you can't weld near wood. So they would just immediately dismiss it and they wouldn't even think it through because you can't weld wood. You can't weld near wood. It burns. And so I thought, since I'm using a dark wood and I'm only going to burn it for a second, the burn might not even show. And then I could also just sand it away if it does show or I could leave it. So just being loose in your planning and not being so uptight because the way the chair is made, you can't assemble it without welding those rings in mm -hmm. place. Yeah. So, it, you know, somebody who hasn't jumped into metalworking, um, you know, and they're just camping out in woodworking, which is great. You know, it's a passion for a lot of people, which is fantastic. But it does give you that, you know, that ability to kind of stretch your, your, your selection of materials. What would somebody who's maybe on the fence, like what would be your advice to somebody who maybe looks at it as uh, maybe a daunting task to get into metalworking or add uh, yeah, to their... You know you got to do what I did when I was about 18. I just want, when I was a kid, I'm 53 years old. There was, there used to be a company called JC Whitney. I don't know if they're still available, but JC Whitney was a company where you could buy tools like at a catalog. We'd get it once every few months and it was about a half inch thick and there was all kinds of tools in there. And I bought a, a, a stick welder. I think it was a Lincoln stick welder from JC Whitney. And it was my first welder. And I just experimented. I, <laughs> my thought process is instead of being daunted by the task that needs this object, just get that object and you're partway there to doing the task. So nice. I never welded. I didn't know anybody that welded. So I bought a welder for however many, it might've been $300 or $200 at the time. It was like a tombstone welder, what they call it. It's just like a little buzz box with a dial in the middle and two leads. And unfortunately I lost it in a move. I ended up storing it somewhere. I wish I would have <laughs> still had it because I would have been, would have been right there on the wall hanging up as my first welder. But that, uh, that is a good example of people want to weld all the time. I always say, go get a Lincoln 140. You can get it at Home Depot or Lowe's and just get jump right into it and just figure it out. If you needed gas, you know, just ask somebody at the welding supply place, suck it up, be the fool for 10 minutes and ask a couple of dumb questions. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's really, it's, that's another big part of welding is people are always intimidated. They're afraid they're going to look stupid. Yeah. You're going to look stupid. Get over it. Just the, I looked stupid 10 years ago when I didn't know some of these more advanced processes that I know now. And, you know, you, you begin to learn before you even realize you're learning. Suddenly you're talking the language that you were intimidated to even jump into. So it's important. Just just get over looking stupid and feeling stupid and just do it. Okay. Uh, all right. So for those of you who are just joining us again, this is part of a four-part series. Jimmy has Monday. John Peters is coming up. You can click the link in the description if you're watching on YouTube. If you're not, you're already in the private Facebook group. Um, just if you wanted to join us for the next few days and get some more tips and trip, tricks from YouTube's top makers. Uh, we're gonna get into, uh, we get a lot of questions at the Makers Mob. You know, we get beginners coming in, which is fantastic. We always wanna you know, help out the best that we can, obviously. Um, wood dimensioning comes up a lot. And so, yeah. you know, and I, I don't, I'm not sure people fully grasp that when they start a project, what's that right. involved with, you know, or, or, or the right. process involved in it, sorry. So maybe just speak into dimensioning wood before a project and making sure it's a fit and your, maybe your process there. 
Well, you know, like for instance, these this is these are clips of me and Aaron working on the gate, uh, prepping the wood for the gate. And I wanted to make the gate lighter, so these pieces of wood were exactly one inch thick. And not only that, they were rough cut, so meaning they were oversized. They were one inch, but a little oversized. And in some cases, they were fresh cut, so they were heavy because they were wet. And I knew being part of this fence, they weren't going to be critically joined. So it wasn't a big deal that they were going to shrink and contract or attract and expand. Um, but the, the, the key to buying, the reason you might buy uh, uh, unplaned wood is because it's cheaper. You can go and buy rough cut lumber. You can get really exotics for cheaper than getting exotics that are surfaced. Right. And if you have a thickness planer and a table saw, that's really all you need as a beginner. You could take you could take a, a, a rough cut piece. Aaron, hand me that piece right that's sitting over there. That's actually a piece from this that piece. You, this is a piece from the image you just showed. This okay. is a piece. This is a piece of the one inch thick rough cut oak. They sell it as horse fence planking, which is the 16 feet long. And they're like a they're like $16 each by six inches, by 16 feet, by one inch, because they're rough cut. So that's yeah. white oak, 16 feet long for under 20 bucks for a giant piece. Wow. And um, the the point I was going to make is, if you want to put a fresh line down the edge on the table saw, for instance, get a piece of plywood, rip a one foot piece of plywood, eight feet long, take some air nails and nail the piece of wood to it. So now you have a good piece traveling the fence, that's your plywood, and have this hang over that one foot piece of plywood and then pass that through the table saw, and you have a nice clean edge that's now. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna draw a little picture of that because I got my pad right next to me. All right, see it. Um, let's say you uh, you you take your your rough cut piece, and uh, you nail it to a cleanly cut piece of plywood, like that. And now okay. you pass that you pass that through the table saw. Here's your table saw fence. Yeah. I'm drawing, I'm drawing. And your your blade is cleaning up the edge. Gotcha. So you know it, it cuts off that rough edge. And when it cuts that rough, you just remove these air nails, or if you have a couple of screws, I can't even figure it's a mirrored image, so I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna flip my brain around. So um, take out those few screws, and now you have a, a clean, flat edge on this board to then go against the fence. So that's a way of doing joining, and then you could surface plane it on your thickness planer. And now you have four clean sides with a table saw and a surface planer, which is you know surface planer is cheap, fantastic you know, man, affordable, awesome. Buying a, buying a joiner unless you buy like something used, which I always promote to buy used stuff on. Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace because there's so many people that jump into woodworking and then get broke and they can't they can't make a living at it and they yeah. don't have time and so they need some extra dough, especially in these trying times we're living through. It's a good opportunity to really look for some good deals. So you can get a good joiner. You know, yeah. a lot of guys have joiners sitting like they're like third generation woodworkers that aren't woodworkers and their dad or their grandfather has yeah. this stuff sitting in the barn and they don't even know what it is. They don't even yeah. care. You know, yeah. once I like do, look at cleanouts and stuff, that's why I'm such a junkie when it comes to you know buying old tools. There's so many good things out there that are being underutilized. Awesome, bud. Okay, thanks for that. We're gonna transition into adhesives. We'll look at wood glue in a minute and your process there. Um, but in terms of when you ultimately when you go to um, you know whether you're putting well this this is oh, yeah. your, your guillotine video here. Let me just put the push yeah. play on that. Um, and maybe just speak to this adhesive that you incorporated on this one here. Oh, that's when I glued brass to a piece of, I think that's mahogany or I forget what kind of wood that was. It might've been mahogany. Um, I glued a piece of brass to mahogany and I had, I needed, I needed that brass to like kind of be machine to ride in that groove. So it yeah. was important that the brass has like a certain kind of slickness to it against wood, but I didn't want it to slide on the other wood. If you have a nice tight fit between two things with like, you know, like a, like maybe a hundred thousandth or two hundred thousandth clearance, CA glue will secure that for good. Like for instance, all my ice picks, uh, for the most part, I glue that joint with CA glue. When you have a nice sheer joint, like two things that could potentially slide on each other, a little bit of CA glue between those joints, you're not going to slide. When you have a butt joint with CA glue, just so you know, it is a fragile joint; it could break easy. But when it's like an overlap joint, like okay. this, it's almost never going to go away. 
you know, it's never going to break. But a, like a butt joint like that, if you're going to use CA glue, is really more for temporary holding. If it's a broader joint, that's a butt joint, you could put CA glue in wood glue. The wood glue will do more work in the long term. The CA glue will do its work in the short term. Okay, and then there's another... Um... Uh, is this so? This was the fence, and now the material is here. Maybe to speak to the material and the selection of. Um... Well, it's funny. You know what I was doing for this one. Um, behind the scenes, Taylor designed this fence. She designed this whole gate. And it was her idea to do everything this way. I she just knew that I could. You know, she's like, "What do you think of a gate if we make it like this?" And I came in with a couple of little engineering ideas. But for the most part, this whole concept was hers. And she said, "No nails. If we can do it with no nails." Wow. And so I glued it together with PL glue. And then after a day, I realized there's no way the PL glue is going to keep it going because the wood's going to curl and pucker a little bit. It'll hold it, but in a year and a half from now, it'll probably let go, especially with the, the wood expanding and contracting so much. And then the, the steel is also a little cold. And then I'm not only necessarily gluing to the steel, I'm gluing to the paint on the steel mm -hmm. so the paint can pull off later. So with all these things in consideration, I decided to put a couple of screws, secretly small screws, right in the face. You see it in the video. So yeah. the PL glue was my first attempt. I never even put it to the, to the full test before I, I didn't trust it. So okay. PL glue is really good in a situation where you're going to have like a concrete versus wood or glass versus like a cement wall or wood and glass. It works really well. We just use it a lot on the, what do we use a lot? It's on the trailers. What's that? This PL glue. We use, a oh, lot, yeah, yeah. we use a lot of it like connecting the trails. So PL glue works really good, especially for, you know, it says exterior interior, but it really works best, I believe for interior purposes. But the, the other problem with PL glue is you really got to let it dry. You got to let it dry for 24 hours before you, uh, you know, move on. Okay. And then, uh, so when you're dealing with hardware, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit in terms of your selection process there, mm -hmm. um, uh, when you're say putting like brass hardware on a project or whatever that looks like, what's your adhesive that you'd recommend or what's, you know, well, it depends. Like I said, C CA glue is good to keep things in place temporarily, but I mean, s some hardware should have screws with it. Right? Yeah, I noticed that little plug, that little plug thing you just showed. That was the uh, the that holds the door open on the sewing box. That little plug was CA glued in. Okay, and and it works okay, but I don't trust it. Like it, it really should need like a side bolt or like a side nail to grab it. But CA glue, I like to use CA glue to like keep the project moving so I'm not fumbling. So if you notice there, I use the CA glue to glue the hinges in place. Yeah. So I could then open up the box and put the screws in. It also, you know, when you put that screw in that hole, if you don't drill that hole right in the center, you're going to shift that, that hinge around, especially when you have like that, that beveled head screw that goes, you know, inside the hinge. So I like to CA glue it so that if that screw hole is a little off, it doesn't shift before I put all three or four screws into the hinge. So that's just me. Uh, next one, we're going to take a look at. Um, so I'm going to go one more slide here. Do we do any questions? Uh, Other people asking questions? A few. I'm going back and forth, but there's a lag between. Oh, you're answering some questions? A couple. Oh, good. Aaron's in the uh, chat, so Aaron will answer okay. any questions. Fantastic. That's awesome. Okay, so the next one is actually so from adhesives going into wood glue. Um, you know, we're going to take a look at. Oops, sorry. Let me just pull it up here. Um, this project right here. Um, this was the table um, that you made a while back. Oh, and yeah. That uh, was like an island for my friend's uh, kitchen island. Yeah. Is so the reason why, why I brought this up is because it's, a, you know, it's when you put it together here, it's rather large. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think you use a biscuit joiner on it um, yeah. when you put it together. So what's your process here? Is there any tips or tricks that you could share with the audience that are that's well, watching? I you know, uh, when, when I glue a big, broad table like this together, when there's a lot of things, I like to do it in sections. Okay. Some guys, you know, trust their skill set. I don't necessarily trust my skill set. I don't trust the glue. I don't trust the wood more than I don't trust me. So I'll glue two to two. Then okay. I'll glue four to four and then five to five. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. you're seeing the last glue up, but this is like day two or day three where I glued two to two to two. And then I glued, you know, so then I made a group of four and then I made the whole thing. So I glued them together in sections. Okay. I just don't trust that something's not going to cup or buckle. That's just me. So now all I have to worry about are those two big broad panels because I got to worry about these two. I make them straight. 
Then I got to worry about these four. I make them straight. Mm -hmm. Then I got to worry about just these two panels and I make them straight. And then when you're putting the clamps on there, like the buckling's not an issue at that point. Yeah, not nearly. You know, you're only worrying about one buckle right in the middle as opposed right. to at every joint, you're going to have like, you know, like this across the whole surface. So then your canoe built, which if you haven't seen, you got to go check that out on uh, Jimmy's channel here. Um, the first uh, on YouTube. Uh, at this, uh, whoops, where do we go here? Sorry. Uh, we'll get to this one in a second. I got to go back here. Um, obviously the glue is a big part of, you know, making sure yeah. that this, wow, what's going on here? Sorry about that. Let's jump back yeah, here. I, I always find yellow glue works the best, you know, uh, yellow glue is just like any, any PVA, like just straight up glue. Like whether it's, even if it's white Elmer's glue, I think works just as well as anything else. You know, the, the nerds that are so into uh, uh, type on one, two, and three. I personally hate type on three. It seems like you're gluing stuff together with cottage cheese. I don't understand what it's <laughs> for. Um, but I use type on one and two or Elma's yellow. I mean, I don't have, uh, you know, I'm not being paid by anybody. So I just say whichever yellow glue works best for you. And, and what I'm doing on the here on this boat is all just regular yellow glue. You can see the bottle there. It's probably yeah. the type on or Elma's glue. Um, you know, uh, glue is just, it's almost like, uh, it's like a natural uh, gift from the, uh, the natural gods because I don't know what's in it. I'm sure they process it. I'm sure. What, what's that? What the hell's in PVA glue? I'm asking Aaron. Oh, is it? It starts as milk, I think. Oh yeah. It's like curdled milk. That's right. I forgot about that. So it starts wow. at, that's why on the, on some of the glues, there's like a little, uh, the Borden cow is on, I think it's okay. Elmer's glue. Yeah, yeah. It starts out yeah. curdled milk. But anyway, that's like I said, that's like a, a natural thing from, uh, you know, the earth. And I'm sure there's other chemicals in it that you shouldn't be able to eat. But <laughs> yellow, glue, yellow glue works great. You know, a lot of people get into these deep discussions. I've, I've made things. I've been making things for clients since I'm about 17, 18 years old. And I've never, ever had a product returned to me because the glue joint fell apart. Wow. Awesome. Usually somebody's like, for instance, a couple of years ago, I had to go back and fix a set of drawers because the homeowner stepped on the drawers like a ladder to change a light bulb. She opened the drawer and then the second drawer stepped on the bottom one and then stepped on the top one. And then the face of the drawer ripped off. Well, there you go. Well, that's I, not normal. That was my detective work. She said, oh, it just broke. I was like, there's yeah. no way. Because <laughs> the joints were like ripped. So she stood, I think she stood on the face of the drawer like a ladder. That was my opinion. Uh, epoxy or resin. Um, do you have any tips around uh, using this? Uh, this is for that table that you glued up, I believe. Yeah, I glued that table up. And if you notice, I was conscious about the saw marks so that it created that chevron pattern. Mm -hmm. I made sure that the saw marks were posing. That was my my main concern. And now here I'm just filling in stuff because this is a kitchen island top. I'm just filling it in with clear. I'm not trying to disguise them. I just don't want to create sp spaces for, you know, insects and, and, uh, and breadcrumbs and stuff. So because this was the kitchen island, I just wanted it to have a smooth top. So I was just using clear resin. I wasn't trying to disguise the holes. I just wanted them to just be flat to the surface. Sometimes you could mix sawdust in there and like the sawdust that you get out of the table saw and the sawdust okay. that you get out of the, the palm sander. If you mix in the sawdust of the same native wood into the palm sander, you get like a similar match and it's a little bit more milky. It's like a little bit more like consistent. It's like wood fillery. Whereas yeah. if you do it with like shavings, you, you still see a little bit of that texture and it's, it's not like you're trying to disguise anything, but it does disguise the fact that it's clear resin. So the, that it, what's the benefit of, of adding the, um, the wood to, to the resin itself? Uh, it makes it's in, in that case, like for the canoe, I did that. And that's where okay. I was trying to hide mistakes or pieces of wood that chipped, you know, while I was working on the canoe, sometimes you have some big chip out when you're using yeah. the hand plane and you can't go back, you can try and glue back in what you want, but you know, all of a sudden you realize you've created a chip out and you're looking at a thousand pieces on the floor and you don't know which is the puzzle piece that goes back in there. And so, you know, you just mix up some epoxy with some of the sawdust and that's okay. how you get. And then like to you, it's the most glaring mistake in the entire thing. And you got to point it out to everybody that walks in your shop. But then when the canoe's hanging up on the ceiling, you forgot where it was, you know? Uh, we're gonna, we got a, I got a few more questions for you. Uh, sanding techniques. You do a couple different ones here. Oh yeah. Um, Let's just take a look at, um, you know, the benefits oh, yeah. of, of no, this. Funny. You did some good work here. Uh, so <laughs> this sometimes, um, what, what I had there, I want to make sure those two, that box lid matches. You know, you can, 
I think the way I made this, I made the, the solid, complete closed box and cut it off on the table saw. Okay. So I have a grain match everywhere. But still, the table saw doesn't give you a perfect match cut. You still have to get rid of like the bump. Sometimes the saw blade acts a little bit differently where it matches where you started. So you might have like a little disjoint, you know, even if it's just a millimeter or two, it looks bad. So to get rid of that, I want to sand the whole open face and I want to sand them together so that they match each other. So what I have on there is a weight. I have a lot of wood on there. I have a lot of sandpaper on the, uh, sorry, on the surface of that wood, that whole bottom is filled with sandpaper. So anywhere I move that I'm making, it's like almost doing like a machinist thing where mm -hmm. I'm making sure if I could take that whole box and put it on a big bridge port with a big giant surface face, face mill, I would face mill that, but that's the way you do it with wood. I face mill all those open edges with just a big giant broad piece of wood. Nice. Um, so then the other technique we're going to take a look at in a second here. Um, is there, or is, while, we're, while we're here, is there a specific grit that you, you know, lean towards when you're finishing with wood or do you have any uh, tips in terms of that? Like, I technically, I stay between like 80 and like 120. Okay. Like for instance, 220 is like the highest I'll really ever go. And primarily because 320 gets clogged so easy. It's such a pain in the ass. Uh, if I have to go higher than that, I'll just like hand sand it with a, with like right. a sponge pad. I okay. won't, I won't palm sand with 320 because it fills up too fast unless it's like a chess board or a cutting board where it's not a ton of, you know, a ton of sanding. And this is the same technique, but I flipped it over because it was easier to move the the frame of that little tray over the sandpaper than to move that over over the tray that's what um, i was doing yeah that's a good tip you know for those of you watching um you know have that all set up and that what type of and then this one sorry use your belt sander yeah um, this is uh this is a uh a, i forget what the hell this is called what is that called a skid sander what is that machine stroke called? Sander. a stroke sander i can there are certain things in my life i could never retain there's certain people whose names i'll never remember as long as i die and and there's that machine i'll never remember the name of that machine it's just like a weird brain block so that stroke sander um i picked up from a fan and uh okay I picked it up, uh, I paid 1200 bucks, I think, for it. And it's a 220 volt stroke sander, works amazing. And it's got like an 80 foot st st strip of sandpaper. And, you know, with a pad, you push it over where you need it. It goes in and out like this. And then you just pre pressure on it. And it's it's an amazing machine to have when I need it. I don't always need it, but when I have it, to, when I have it and it's there, it's incredible. Um so a couple more here. We're going to take a look at um, your actual hardware selection. So when it comes to the design of a project that you know it's going to need hardware, what's your what's your process uh, for that? Do you just go to the shop and see, or, or to the store to see what's there, or do you already know uh, what type of hardware you're going to be adding? Because I mean, like you think about like the the guillotine. I think it's titled "How to Cut a <laughs> How to Cut a Burrito." <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. The hardware that's on that, maybe you machine some of it yourself. I had but. to make it, yeah. Well, it's it's funny. I always look for opportunities to make my own hardware just because I want to just show, you know, like a wide breadth on the channel. But sometimes I find hardware and I find it super sexy, like the sewing box we keep using as an example. I think yeah, that was Brusso, Brusso hardware, Brusso hinges and Brusso uh, Is that this latch. one here? Yep. They were really sexy. They, the latches just like glue in. They're really, you make a nice clean pocket for them and you CA glue them in. And those are really sexy. So having sexy hardware is also inspiring, but mm -hmm. it's really nice to make hardware. Like for instance, uh, this this weekend, yesterday, I posted the video of uh, the chicken coop hinge, yep. you know, the chicken coop latch, which was very, very fun for me to do. You know, I, that was a simple thing to make a, a latch for the chicken coop. It was a, it was a simple concept, but I wanted to make it complicated and as sexy as possible, and uh, I was able to do that. So that was fun. Uh, so then, it, like when when it comes to, I mean, so either a you say, okay, is it on the marketplace, or I mean, you enjoy the process of obviously making your own hardware. So yeah, where, if where I have you the opportunity, I can, I will. You okay. know, not always though. I mean, sometimes it's the like the, the wood project for here. This was for Rockler, so it was really more important for me to do the woodworking project. It all depends on you know, what it is I'm trying to showcase, you know, that's a little bit more of a different discussion, but you know, for, as far as marketing goes, like, what am I showcasing? I'm showcasing right. the woodwork here. If, uh, you know, when I did the blacksmithing thing the other day, I was showcasing my blacksmithing, uh, you know, ability that I'm always learning. So. Cool. Uh, I could have, I could have went to home Depot and bought a slide latch, brought it back and put it on the chicken coop, but that video would have been about a minute long. It would have been fun. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, one thing that you are maybe uh, you're well known for is um, well, you did this one project here. Let me pull it up. Um, sorry, I just found the splinter in my palm. It's so okay. exciting. Uh, maybe some tips around um, you know using the saw, the, uh, the band saw. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you know one, one, one really important tip when you guys want to, if anybody wants to learn how to sculpt on the bandsaw, obviously you got to take some daring. Uh, you got you got to be daring. You got to take some chances. But one thing that's really important is you don't want to high side. And like when you high side on a motorcycle, that's obviously really dangerous. And when you high side on a bandsaw, what I what I mean by that is this is the bandsaw blade. This way, let me put your let me put your full screen here. If this is the bandsaw blade and you go to cut into this part of your material, it'll pull down like that. So if okay. you're cutting the high side, you got to really be, you got to hold that with like all your might. If that's the only way to do it, better to cut it um, on the low. Like for instance, like if, if your piece of, it's hard to explain without having the saw in front of me, but if your piece of wood is tall like this and you go like that, it's going to slam down. So it's better to cut it with the shortest piece as close to the table as possible is all I'm trying to say okay. with any one of your pointed cuts. So if you're going to cut like the corner off a triangle and you're going into the bandsaw blade like this as low to the table as possible. So it won't pull you into the blade. If you're cutting anything round, if you're sticking anything round into a bandsaw blade, you're basically sticking a pulley into a, 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 a flat belt. So mm. if you go to stick it and it's going to pull it out of your hands and spin it. You got to be super careful. That's why a lot of times when you see me cutting any kind of round stock, I'm holding it with a screw clamp. I just right. thought I had a clamp here, but you know, a screw clamp is uh, or any clamp or hot glue it to a piece of square wood. So when you go to stick it into the blade, it's not going to get pulled into a turn. Good. It's really important. That, like that's, that's where it's super scary. I see a lot of kids go to cut like a pencil in half on the bandsaw or a dowel and the blade immediately starts spinning that piece of material because they're not, they don't expect it to be taken away by the blade and it's super scary. So that's, you just got to be prepared for anything. So when you go to put a piece of material into the bandsaw, that's not flat against the table. Yeah. You got to super, super hold. I mean, this is, Aaron just handed me this. A lot of times I use this as my fingertips. I'll hold, you know, a small piece of material. If I'm going to sculpt it on the bandsaw, I'll, I can go in there like this. Right. It gives it the weight. It doesn't yank it out of my hands. And it also keeps my hands away from the blade. So that's, that's if it's on the high side? Either anyway, anyway. I mean, it's like I said, it's hard to explain without the bandsaw right in front of me. But that is the problem. When you go to sculpt something, the blade will pull it and spin it against the table one way or another. You got to be prepared for that. And if you can give more leverage to your stock by putting a clamp on it or holding it like you know, hot gluing more wood to it so that it doesn't pull out of your hands, that's a, that's a good tip. That's you know, that's for your safety. Awesome. Uh, I know you got another meeting coming up in a little bit, um, and I promised you we'd give you time to grab a cup of coffee if you needed it. What time is it now? We got, uh, we, got, yeah. we got about 10 minutes. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, one more thing, um, joinery. Um, uh, maybe just talk about this technique here and, you know, how you, oh, okay. uh, you, know, how you kind of process this out. And um, Oh, yeah. That's, uh, wow, that's beautiful. That's, uh, that's my uh, rockler table before it got rusty. Look how beautiful it is. Rust seems to follow me wherever I go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is a uh, that is an old technique. Uh, a lot of people a lot of people know that technique. We're just making finger joints on the router table there. Um, one trick that I do with my with my router table, uh, I don't know what that technique is actually called. It's just like a. I'll show you. One thing I like to do is if I have my my stem this is the thing that's going to go into the joint that the that the blade is making i really should there really should be like a dado cut so that's like a like a router bit or a dado okay. stack right there okay and then this is my stem that little piece of wood that i keep moving the joint onto right over right over here i make it a little bit skinnier and i make room for it to put tape on either side of that so I make it just slightly skinnier and then I snug it up with a little bit of tape on this side or a little bit of tape on that side so I could move that joint over where I want. There is obviously a way of making that adjustable. If, if I was, uh, you know, if I was Matthias Wandel, I would make that adjustable. But yeah. because I'm a little bit lazy, I sometimes <laughs> make it skinnier and I take up the slack with, if it needs three layers of tape on this side and one on this side, 
to move the joint over, I tr make a couple of trial and errors. And then when I get it right, I just make sure I leave it. That's it. And uh, so I think it's important that that little joint needs to move over that distance between the blade and that, that peg is super critical and you can get joints that are so tight. You have to hammer them together. You can get joints that are a little bit looser for the glue to get in there. Mm -hmm. And you can have joints that are too loose that you got to fill with resin. So it's important that little bit of adjustment is taken up with a couple of little layers of tape and a piece of tape is thir three or four thousandths thick. So that's all I'm talking about is mm -hmm. leaving like, 10 thousandths off of it so you could move the joint over 10 thousandths this way, you know, within 10 thousandths this way or 10 thousandths that way by adding or taking away layers of tape. Oh, wow. Awesome. So that's what uh, I think that's going to wrap it up in terms of the tips and, you know, workshop uh, tricks that you've shared today. Uh, Jimmy, uh, maybe show the audience what's going live this Thursday. Do you have a knife with you? Oh, yeah. Do you have so, guys, uh, if you guys know some of the, the crew in the Maker Mob, I'm honored that they would all take one of these knives and modify it. So if you buy one of these knives that we're going to be selling on uh, on uh, Thanksgiving, we're going Black Friday, um, you basically get this piece of 420 stainless. It's very sharp when you open it up out of the package. But I'm encouraging people to mod these themselves. I want you to get this knife and change the shape of it, Make a, leave it exactly the same if you want, make a sheath for it, and... This is really going out there to give you a starting point. This is a, consider this like a knife blank or just use it as is. That's why I kind of made it a vaguely generic shape. You could mod it. You could do what you want, but that's the point, you know, and they're cheap enough where you can get two of them. You could put one on the wall and you could take one to the shop and mod it. I also wanted, wanted it to be cheap enough where you don't feel bad about prying open paint cans with it or slicing up pizza with it or doing whatever you want to it. So I want, I want to see people mod these and have fun with them. So that's and really giving you a starting point. You're going to be releasing a video around your modification on Thursday, I believe. Is that correct? Yep. yep. Awesome. Uh, just to quickly recap, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, we really encourage you to click the link uh, in the description below to join the private Facebook group. Like we mentioned at the beginning of this live, it is a four-part series, um, a woodworking teaching series from the Makers Mob. Tomorrow we have John Peters coming up and then Adam Hankel and the Samurai Carpenter. There's going to be some free plans and some giveaways. And if you're in there... And if you're watching on Facebook right now, um, we're going to have some prizes that we're going to give away this weekend. And so uh, we're going to kind of give away a keyword each, uh, each live that we're doing inside the group. And if you just quickly type into the comments, um, dress the knife, that's the keyword for this live in, uh, in Facebook. Um, again, if you're not in the Facebook group, go ahead and click the link in the description below. And uh, we will see you in there. You type that in there while it's going live and you'll be eligible for the prizes that will be handed out on Saturday. Tomorrow's John Peters. And these knives are going live. We're actually going live on Thursday with them. Um, oh, they're going to be for sale on Thanksgiving Day? Yeah. It's, I think that's going to go live. Yeah. yeah. They're awesome. I don't know. I just, I just create stuff. These you guys do. deal with all the complicated parts. The hardest part for me is selling and marketing. The easiest part is making. Yeah. And bless and then the people as you do it. Selling, we're only selling about 2,000 of these, and that's it. So There you go. Limited supply. Thank you, brother. Thanks for your time, man. Uh, thank if you're you. watching, thank you for spending 45 minutes with us or so. And I know you thank got you. a meeting coming up. So, yeah. Thank you, Jimmy. And I'm going to end thank it here. Um, take care, man. We'll talk to you soon. Do I hang up? Is this it? Uh, I'll take care of that for you. All I'll right. Just end broadcast. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> okay. Take care, man. See ya. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.